You know, Matt, can you go around and just tell them that we are starting? This will not work like that. Go around and ask everyone we are starting. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> no, that's okay. You're welcome. So we are we are starting next panel. We are we are starting next panel. Yeah, we have told them like that as well. Jennifer, thank you. Remove all yeah. and also ask everyone to come from outside. Let's move forward. Uh, I want to announce our next speaker. In fact, the keynote speaker. So I want to invite uh, Jeff Jarvis to deliver his uh, keynote speech. We will be breaking up for lunch after his speech. Uh, we'll be out for about uh, 60 minutes, which means we'll be back around uh, 2 o'clock. Uh, 1 o'clock, I'm sorry. No, 2 o'clock. So Jeff uh, Jarvis, is a, uh, before I invite him to speak, uh, I want to tell you a little bit uh, about Jeff. Jeff Jarvis is a national leader in the development of online news. Thank you. <laughs> so ja Jeff Jarvis is a national leader in the development of online news, blogging, the investigation of new business models for news, and the teaching of entrepreneurial journalism. He writes and influential blog buzzmachine.com. He is the author of the books What uh, Would Google Do and Public Parts How Sharing in the Digital Age Improves the Way We Work and Live, as well as the ebook Gutenberg the Geek. He has also consulted for media companies including The Guardian, Digital First, Media. Post Media, Sky.com, Burda Advanced Publications, and the New York Times Company at about.com. Prior to coming to, okay, okay, this is more than enough. So, Jeff, when you listen to him, I think you will learn a lot from him. We are really delighted to have you, Jeff. Thank you so much for giving us time. It's over to you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning. Uh, I hear you've had a good morning. I'm, I'm so, so delighted to be here uh, among you. And uh, the CCEM folks have done spectacular work uh, in trying to serve you. Our Dean, Sarah Bartlett, as you know, uh, founded CCEM. The priority of you, the Community and Ethnic Media of New York, is, is and New Jersey, I'll add, uh, is important, uh, very important to us. And so we're here to help you in any way we can. It matters greatly to us, and we're really glad you're here. I have a few things to say, but then I, what i really like to have is a conversation, and maybe you're lucky you get to go to lunch early. Uh, I saw it coming in, so I don't want to hold you up from lunch too long. Um, <clears throat> one more plug for CUNY. Uh, how many of you are involved in Spanish-speaking publications? OK, so I, I, I presume you already know about it, but I'm going to plug it again. I am so proud of what this school is doing with the new Spanish language journalism program that we're starting. 
uh, with Graciela Makovsky is heading the program, and and um, uh, it's it's critically important to uh, I think a huge portion of of the population and of the journalism in America, and so the fact that this school is paying attention to that I think matters. It matters so much uh, that Estoy estudiando español. Um, because I was so embarrassed as an American not to speak a damned word of Spanish. So I'm trying, I'm really bad, as you can hear. But uh, I'm very proud of what this school is doing in that program. So I hope you stay in touch with us about that as well, those of you who are in that, uh, that world. Um, <clears throat> so I thought I would talk about three things today, and, th and things that I've been talking about with some um, newspaper companies and other you know, older companies out there and see how they apply to you and how they don't apply to you. But the trends of where I see the business going. Um, and that's one is the question of digital first, and what that means, I'll do that very quickly. Then the idea that I argue that we need to have a relationship strategy in the future of news. And then third, the question of a distributed strategy, which is to say, what do we do about Facebook and all that? So if that's okay, I'll hit those things pretty quickly. Um, first, digital first. Uh, John Payton, I just heard his name mentioned a minute ago, was the um, uh, head of Infermedia and then the head of digital first media, and so he called his company digital first. Um, what the hell does digital first really mean? Some of you are digital first already, because you already you just are digital. That's all you are. Uh, but some of you are print, and I'm not against print at all. I love print. I have a basement filled with my clips from my newspapers. I adore print, but for the larger companies, they have to deal with the question of how to become a fully sustainable, profitable, digital company before the day when print becomes unsustainable and unprofitable. Now, for some of you, you're going to say, that doesn't, that doesn't apply to me because we're profitable in print and this is wonderful and we can see years ahead. And if you can, fine. I'm not, I'm not arguing against that. But the dynamics of the internet and mobile are universal. We know what's going to happen with how they are going to continue to make inroads into where we are, the more you can become fully sustainable digital enterprises, the better. And so what I'm telling the larger newspapers is that they've got to pick a date in the future, not very far in the future, when they know that print will become unsustainable. If by that day they're not profitable on digital, then they'll die. That's just the way it is. So maybe that date for you is a generation ahead. And God bless if it is. I'm delighted. But for some newspapers in the US, you know, we know they lost classified. We know they lost a huge amounts of retail advertising with consolidation and now with Amazon. Um, we know that they lost, um, uh, well, I think that they're about, this is controversial given the panel that was just here, but I think they're about to lose a lot of government advertising of legal ads because open data movements are going to move government data online for free. And I think the requirement to print it is probably going to go away. And so though I hope you can get every dollar you can out of these government people. Get it out of them fast because the more that we have open data movements, the less there's going to be. For metropolitan newspapers in the US, the last good economic reason to print and distribute a newspaper is inserts, what we call freestanding inserts. And um, you know, I know from one major retailer, they told me three years ago that I asked them, how long is this going to last? Uh, and they said two to three years. That was three years ago. Uh, you look at McClatchy, the second largest newspaper chain, their insert business went down 24% in a year. Department store use of inserts went down 27%. So our role as a distributor keeps going down and down and down and down. So what that means in the larger English language metro market <clears throat> is that you have some newspapers, especially in advance, full disclosure, I consult for advance, um, where they've reduced their frequency to three days a week. That's because those are the days when they have circulars. If the circulars disappear, guess what? So you're going to see more and more and more push toward digital in that world. You're in a different world. And what I want to talk about with you, and I hope we have a conversation across the whole room, is how much you think this does or doesn't apply to you. But I know one of CCEM's priorities is to help make you as digital as you want to be and to help reduce the fears and concerns and issues and, and, to, and to bring training and other things to that. I think that's God's work. Because in my view, the more digital you are, the better, period. Doesn't mean you don't have print. I'm not against print. 
but it just stands to reason that the more digital you can be, the better. And digital, of course, especially in a lot of your markets, doesn't mean that, it means this. And, and in the world, that means that you can leapfrog the old laptop world. Let me tell you a quick story. So I, I um, no, I'll do this later. I'll do that story later. Um, so uh, digital first. That's my view on digital first. I think you've got to see a future where you are profitable digitally, where print is optional. Print brings in the gravy. That's fine. Again, not against that. But uh, if you are not profitable digitally, I think you're vulnerable. That's one. Two, uh, relationship strategy. And again, I realize that part of this deals with bigger publications, but I think it affects you as well. I think what the internet really killed is the mass media business model, the volume-based business model, uh, what we call reach and frequency in advertising, right? Where we sell eyeballs as a commodity. Indeed, when we sell CPM, we're selling eyeballs by the ton, 2,000 eyeballs, right? And um, we know where that's going. The price of that advertising keeps going down because the volume goes up. And there's an old joke in retailing that uh, I, I lose money on every sale, but I make it up on volume. That is our business model today. We're losing money on every ad sale, but we need more and more and more volume. And how do we do that in mass media? There's one formula, and that's cats and Kardashians, right? We're cheapening what we do by trying to get traffic to us with, with cheap ways. And we all love cats. I love my family cat too. But we can't make a future in a business out of cats and Kardashians. What we're trying to do there is hold on to the old volume-based business model. I constantly need more and more and more and more volume. So I believe what we have to do is shift from a volume-based model to a value-based model. And I think that you, in this room, can be way, way ahead of big old mass media in doing this. What I tell the big old newspapers and the big old media companies is that they must learn how to stop treating the public as a mass all the same. And they have to learn how to start treating people as individuals and members of communities. And they have to bring them more relevance. And the way you bring someone more relevance is that I know something about you. I know what community you're in. Well, here we are in community media. But even within your communities, you have the opportunity, you know, in the Spanish-speaking world, you have many diaspora involved. And you have the community, you have the ability to serve those people now digitally in ways you couldn't in print because you can now serve the Colombians versus the Mexicans versus the Argentines in ways that print didn't allow. That's a huge new opportunity that digital makes possible. So I think that we've got to move to a world where we know people as individuals and members of communities. And the way we're going to do that throughout media, I think, is by creating more new products that are more targeted to people's needs. I think product development is at the heart of the future of media strategy in general. Now, again, I know some of you are going to say, I'm already small. You're going to slice me up into smaller slices? Yes and no. I think that the opportunity that you have is to make things that serve people in a way that is more relevant to them so that when they come to you, you know more about them and you give them greater value and you get greater value. So just a, an example, an obvious example. If you want to serve, let's say, young mothers, then right now in a newspaper, you try to put in more stories that will be useful to young mothers. Online and on digital and on mobile, you make a new product that particularly serves the needs of young mothers. And we can brainstorm about how to do that. Yes, you may have some content, but you might also have a lot of functionality, uh, a matching service so that mothers can find each other and, and, and join together in the playground in the park at certain times of the day, uh, a database of, of common medical questions uh, and links and resources in the city, um, discounts to advertisers you already have, for, for family, for, for, for strollers and, and, and things like that. And so on and so on and so on. 
So you can imagine making a new product, a new service that targets young mothers because A, you can give them greater value and B, you will then get greater value from them. So now we can brainstorm about how you can make more money this way. If you're giving people something that has greater value to them and they are more engaged in it, they come back more often and they spend more time, even under the old business model, you can make more money because you have more ad avails for them. They're back more often. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, the next level is that clearly you have the opportunity for more targeted advertising at a higher value. Right? You go to the advertiser who sells the strollers. Yes, you can have that ad in a newspaper now, but a huge proportion of the audience you deliver is wasted to them because they're not having babies. You say, I'm going to a young mother audience, then clearly you are more targeted in the higher value advertising that's going to perform better. Next, um, I think there are opportunities in events that you can have sponsored events and bring people together. That if you have a more targeted community, uh, you're more likely that people are going to come out for those events. Um, next, I think there's opportunities in commerce, even with Amazon. You could create your own store with affiliate fees of 50 things that young mothers need that you can provide and you get a small percentage, it's not much, uh, but you can get a bit of commerce and there's other ways to do that. And I think look at the fact that Uber is going to start local deliveries. Look at the fact that Amazon is doing one hour delivery in New York. There's going to be a new war around local retail coming. And we've only begun, only just begun to see the beginning of it. And it could be very harmful to the retailers who are our advertisers. So the question in the long run is how can we help them with uh, advertising to local people so that they, people can get delivery of things through the many mechanisms that I think will come down the line. Um, that's an opportunity. Then I think there's an opportunity for membership. Now at a, at a large scale basis, uh, I'm working with the, the Guardian these days, and they're trying to pin a lot of financial hope on the idea of membership. And the Guardian, of course, is a worldwide news organization, a very different scale from you. But I think that there could be opportunities here. So let me talk about membership for just a few minutes. In membership, I see three things to pay attention to. New tribes or affinities, new um, rewards, and new contributions. So let me go through each of those the new tribes. The problem with membership in media, those that do it, is that it tends to be another word for subscription or begging. Right? If you're the New York Times and they start a club, what they really just want is get money out of you. Uh, they're not really coming up with something that's terribly valuable, I don't think, around membership. If you look at WNYC, and they're wonderful, we love WNYC, it's a great institution. People are giving money to the institution of WNYC. In public media, it runs anywhere from 6 to 12 percent of listeners give money. It's great. It's something that's uniquely American. Because we don't have government-supported media as in other countries, uh, other countries don't have that same culture of giving. But there is a culture here of giving to media for the benefit of the public. Uh, but the problem there is that, and I, we're doing some work also with WBEZ in Chicago, a public media station, uh, where They've seen the limit years since of how many people will give to the institution of WBEZ. Now with podcasting, people can give to one show or they can give to one project. They can support one thing out there. And that means that people have an affinity. They feel more a member of a different group. I'm not a WBEZ member. I'm a Chicago Young Mothers member. Obviously, I'm not, but you get the idea. Um, Right? So, so what are those affinities and what are those tribes where people can do this? Then we go to new rewards. Why are people giving money to WBEZ or WNYC or ProPublica or Texas Tribune? Um, well, in some cases, it may be a subscription. I'm giving money to get content. That's the old model. More likely, they're giving money because they want social status, right? Why does, why does WNYC give out tote bags? So you can walk down the street and say, look how smart I am, right? Um, social stature. I help support this. This matters. I'm, I'm in a position where I can help support it, and I do. 
Um, some people want to feel as if they've accomplished something, that they've had a role in making something happen. Quick story about WFMU in Jersey City, which is an alternative radio station, not NPR, but publicly supported, wacky, wacky stuff on the air. You listen to them, they, they, they'll put anything on the air, anything. And so they have people who are really involved in these small communities of, of interest there. So WBEZ one year, I mean WFMU one year, about three or four years ago, said, you know what, we're sick of these pledge drives, we're going to get rid of them, come online and give us the money there. And it worked. They got the money without having to do the pledge drive. They thought, this is great. The next year they did it again. People said, well, I already, I already gave money to you last year. No. So the next year they said, well, you know, we want to build a studio in Jersey City so you can all come to concerts there. Will you help us do that? People said, yes, and it worked again. There's a big lesson in, in, in the idea that people want to help accomplish something. I can imagine some of you saying, we want to do this. We want to create a young mother's directory, but we can't afford to. Will you help us do that? And we'll give you credit for that. We'll say, we'll say thank you to you for helping us do that. I think there's power in that. The third is new contributions of value. Not everyone can afford to give us money, but people can give us other things that are valuable to us if we're ready for it. They can give us their effort. They can give us their marketing. If somebody goes out and constantly tweets your stories and gets you audience, if somebody goes out and gets you other members, that's value. We should recognize that value. You know, I tell The Guardian, if somebody, they had a big plan, a big thing recently to, to lobby foundations to keep oil in the ground. So they had people write to the Gates Foundation. Didn't work. But um, I said, if somebody did that, you should have said, thank you for doing this. Here's a two-month membership as a way to say thank you and we value that. What you did had value for us. So people can give us value. They can give us effort, marketing, expertise, time, attention. They can give us data about themselves. I know you're a young mother, that has value. I can, I can make more money off you as a result. So look at those ideas of new affinities, new communities, how to serve them better, new ways that, that we can reward them for that and new ways that they can give us value. In Europe, we're seeing the beginnings of some new models around this. There's a business, uh, has anyone here heard of De Correspondent in the Netherlands? It's a um, publication of journalists, again, not quite like you, but there may be lessons in this, that's why I bring it up. So there's about four different models across Europe. De, De Correspondent has a model of high-end journalists covering big beats, and, and I say, listen, I really want to support Simon because he does great work on the environment, and I'm, I'm going to pay the correspondent so I know that I support him. Now, what I get in return in their case is content. It's a paywall. But there's a twist to it. Joe over there is a cheapskate. He doesn't pay for it. He doesn't know crap. These are my students, so that's why I can abuse them. And uh, they paid for me to abuse them. Isn't that amazing? It's a great business model. Uh, so Joe doesn't subscribe. Simon can send the article to Joe, and Joe can read the entire article for free. Your content is your best ad, right? So reading the entire article, Joe then says, crap, this is good, I think I'll, I'll join too, and it works for them. Uh, there's a kind of a copycat in Germany called Kraut Reporter. Uh, it's not working quite so well. There's one in Denmark called Zetland, uh, which is from one of our students here in the entrepreneurial program, uh, Lea Korsgaard. And it's different because it's making most of its money on events. There's one in Madrid called El Diario, which I think is very interesting because a lot of people, I think something like 14,000 people give something like 60 euros a year, and it's not a paywall. They're just saying Spain needs this, so we're going to support this work. Uh, there's one in Hungary whose name I always forget. Uh, there's a new one in Greece that's on, on Kickstarter right now or on Indiegogo right now. Um, I think there's opportunities there for some of you with the diaspora to start clubs. And the benefit of the club could be the content, it could be events, it could be parties, it could be um, all kinds of things. And you can get into the club by giving money, but you can also get into the club by bringing more members or by bringing your expertise, or by bringing effort, or by marketing stories. I think this is a new model 
that's worth playing with. It's also worth playing with on a local level uh, where you have kind of a high end of membership around that. So this comes back to the idea of relationships. I believe that, that, that getting past the old anonymous mass media ways and knowing people as individuals and building products for them is the essence of the future of journalism if we have one. And I believe to my heart that if anyone can explore that well, it is you in community and ethnic media. Because you already know your communities. You know people by name. You know the different interests and clubs that can exist in a community. You can explore and build this in ways that the Star Ledger can't or the Cleveland Plain Dealer can't because it's too big. I talked to an editor of a big paper down south when I came in to talk to his newsroom and, and when he was there he said, well, the reason Jarvis is here is because we have two houses. One of them is on fire and the other one isn't built yet. The one that's on fire is the old media business model, mass media business model. And we've got to throw fire, throw water on that, we've got to figure that out, we've got to keep that going. At the same time, we've got to build this new house without any blueprints. That new house is the high value relationship based model. We know we have to build it. We don't know how the hell to do that. Because the problem is the publisher comes down every day saying, our traffic's going down, our prices are going down, give me more traffic, throw more cats on the fire, more Kardashians, right? And we don't have any time to deal with the future. So, I argue to them, to this paper, that they've got to go out there and just pick one or two communities and go out and listen to that community first. We in big media, mass media, have always been really bad at listening. Really bad at it. Right? We think we listen because we send reporters out to do stories. And the truth is, we all know this, the reporter is listening for the quote they want and, oh good, I'm done now, now I'll fill in that quote. That's not understanding the community's needs. So I go to these big publications and I say, you have to go out and do not go to them. Well, what do we do? We say, oh, I know what young mothers need. I don't need to ask them anything. I'll make a product for young mothers and then I'll say, here, you're welcome. Right? That's the way we've always done it in big media. So I'm trying to get them to learn to listen to communities and find a community that defines itself as a community, a real community, not a fake community like millennials or Hispanics. Right? That's a collection of communities. Find a community that defines itself as a community Go and observe that community. Understand that community's needs. Listen to that community. Well, I think you go up to somebody. So the question was define community then. If I go up to somebody and I say, what, what communities are you a member of? You, the community members define the communities themselves. So it could be, I mean, you know, uh, retirees might define themselves. As, I, I would think it goes around three things. One is geography. I'm a member of this neighborhood or this town. Two is interest. You know, I'm a, I'm a football fan with the round ball. Um, three is, or, or I, I'm one of those strange, odd few people on earth who can understand cricket. Um, uh, Americans are, are genetically incapable of understanding cricket. Or the third is uh, life stage, right? Mother, retiree, right? Um, if somebody came along, you know, when I had my prostate cancer, if somebody came along and said, here's a community of people who have prostate cancer in New Jersey so I can get advice, I would have joined like that, right? Because I, I, that's a community and interest that I had temporarily where I cared about something and other people knew stuff and I could have done that. Joe? So would an interest-based uh, interest community and an experience-based community be along the same lines? So prostate cancer would be something you're interested in because you experienced it as well? Same with like being a member of a certain ethnic or transnational group that's experienced certain exactly. things. Right. And I don't, so I don't know what the definitions of the community are. You have to go to somebody and say, who, who do you feel a part of? So, uh, the, only, uh, uh, the only confusion I have is because you said that Hispanic is not a community. In the sense that we, in, the, in the Anglo press, we have tended to treat all people who speak Spanish as one monolithic community. That is a mistake, right? Within that, there are many, many communities. And within each community, there are more communities, right? Um, uh, Mexican students are a subset of the community of Mexicans in America, right? But there's a community there. So whatever that community is, it's a self-defined community. You'll know it when you hear it from its members. So I try to get these big papers to go and listen to these communities. And I say, do not go to them with an idea. Do not. Go to them 
with an open ear and an empty notebook and sit and listen and understand what their needs are and then come back and try to invent something. Well, you, again, are the model for them because you have an understanding of your community's needs that goes far beyond big old mass media, which treats everybody all the same. So you have a huge advantage in this business model in understanding your communities. But once again, you know, we all have to learn to listen better, but you can provide a model for that. All right, one last point, and then I'll shut up, which is a lie. We'll try. Okay. So um, here I've said try to be digital and try to be relationship-based. And, and even if you say, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll screw you, Jarvis. But even if you say, okay, all right, all right, all right, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take the joke, fine. Now I'm going to mess it all up because now we have the era of distributed media. So now we have Facebook and, and um, Google and Snapchat and Instagram and all, the, and, and, and all these places expecting you to put your stuff there. What do we do about that? No, we're going to talk again in a second. We'll, we'll talk in a second. No, I say we do. Okay, I'll be back to you in a second. I'll say bye and then I'll come back to you. Here's why I say we do. Because that's where our public is. And we... What? Uh, let, me, let, me, let me play through it for a minute. I'll come back. I'll come back. I promise. I promise. I'll come to you first. That was the case until recently. So what happened was that in Europe, publishers went after Google as the enemy. And I have some complaints about their strategy. But, but it brought Google to the table. And Google now wants friends in media. Facebook wants friends in media. So Facebook created instant articles. Now, what Facebook says is that the reason they did this is because the experience of going to a, a, a link on Facebook sucks, and it does, because you wait and wait and wait. You're going to the article, right? And it takes forever to get there. And because the reason for that is because maybe you were getting 80K of content on that web page you went to, but you had to download uh, a meg and a half, three megs of content of, of data and ads and all this other crap and so it's really slow. We know what happens with slow web pages. People give up. It's not worth the wait. There's a whole world out there. I don't need to do that. So Facebook said, let's find a way that we can enable publishers to put content up directly on Facebook, and it's fast. It's instant. And indeed, it is instant. Well, then the next question is, you say, well, OK, obviously, well, I'm giving them my content. What about my money? Facebook said, OK. You can keep 100% of the ad revenue for every ad you sell. For every ad Facebook sells, we keep 70%. I mean, 30%, you keep 70%. You keep 70%. I went to an event that Google held in Europe soon after this was announced, and I said, among others, I said, Google, Facebook just leapfrogged you. What are you going to do about it? You should do an open source version of that. Others said the same thing. Google then did what's called AMP. Does everybody know here? Does anybody here not know what Google AMP is? OK, I'll explain Google AMP. Virgins. I've got virgins in the room. So Google AMP is called Accelerated Mobile Pages. And it's nothing but a subset of web code of HTML. It's a faster web page. That's it. It sets standards in four ways. One is, remember I told you that you download as much as a meg and a half to three megs of code when you download a page? Every time. AMP has a shared library of code, so once it's on the user's computer, they never download it again. So it eliminates all of that. Two, content can be stored and pre-stored closer to the user. Google offers this as a service called a content delivery network, which otherwise you'd pay for. You don't have to use it. It's free. But you don't have to use it. But that makes the content faster. Three is um, that they set standards for advertising. So you don't have all these damned ads that are jumping all over the page and changing the page all over and taking over the page. No, not allowed. Four is they have a shared tracker for data. So if you get to if you use Google Analytics and somebody else uses another analytics, it uses the same one. So this makes pages incredibly fast. But they're just web pages. They're still just web pages. It's your page. It's got your brand, your ad, your analytics, your links on it. But the difference in the experience to the user is huge. If you go to a search on Google and search for a topic like, God help us, Trump, and um, um, whenever I speak in the rest of the world these days, I, I, I apologize for Donald Trump, and I get a big ovation.
Okay, we can have a long discussion. We can have a long, we, we, it was a joke, it was a joke, it was a joke. Uh, well, we'll have a long debate about that too, but let's, okay, excuse me, excuse me. Um, I was just an aside to try to make a joke. I'll come back. Well, I, we can actually have a debate. I do think that advocacy is journalism. I can believe you, we can do an hour on that, but I won't right now because I don't want to waste these people's time. Hmm? Uh, yes, so I can say what I want. Um, where was I now? I was almost done. I was almost done. Um, pardon me. The fourth thing of the app. So app makes content extremely fast. Uh, and, and it does the trackers. So, so what happens is if you go to Google search and you search for a topic like, oh, I don't know Trump, and uh, you see the carousel there of, of, of links, if you click on it, it no longer feels like you have to go to the Washington Post. It, the Washington Post is just boom, right there. And the Washington Post is there with its own ads, its own revenue, everything. It's not sharing anything with Google. The need to be fast online is critical. We in media messed up the web. We messed up the web with too many ads, too much code, too many trackers, too much junk. And we made the web an unpleasant experience for people. Now, we could have fixed that, but we didn't. Google and Facebook came in and they fixed that. Now, if you see that uh, last week, Vox announced a new blog called Circuit Breaker. And they said they're putting it up entirely on Facebook in instant articles. And if you go to your phone on Facebook and look at Circuit Breaker, you will see every article there is an instant article. Boom. With Vox's ad there, they make money on it, it's there. Now, if you click on it on a laptop, it'll look like a website. It'll, it'll, in fact, it will be a website. You'll still go to the web, web page uh, because you still have to have the web page for web people on the browser. But how does that, how does that uh, impact the actual number? Uh, I mean, because you want to drive traffic to your okay. site. That, that's, that's what I'm challenging. That's what I'm challenging. I now argue, Fox said, no, we're going to make a new product and we're going to go to where the users are on Facebook. If you look at one of our beloved local people, uh, Jersey Shore Hurricane News and Justin Osiello, years ago he made his site entirely on Facebook. He has 250,000 followers there. He built it on Facebook. Unfortunately for Justin, there was no way to make money then. There is now. Now, you can argue with me that I shouldn't trust Facebook, but that's a different question. But I do think that we in journalism are, have an obligation to go to where the people we want to serve are. And if you have young people who are on Snapchat, then I would go to them on Snapchat and figure out how to serve them there. If they're on, on chat, we've got to figure that out. And now you can get money from that. So no, I don't think our goal is always to make people come to us. That's rather egotistical of us to think that they should, we are always the destination in life. No, we might serve them on YouTube. We might serve them on Facebook. We might serve them on Snapchat. And we should figure out how to do that. We should figure out the best ways to do that. That's very complex. It's very difficult. Now I'm going to come back and get yelled at. Um, but I think that that's critical. I think that matters greatly. Uh, and, and if we don't do that, if we still say, no, 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 I set the rules. You have to come to me. OK, you can do that. It's your content. It's your business. But I think you're going to lose out on people and other competitors are going to come in and say, well, I started this thing on Facebook and I serve people there. Uh, all right, so why am I completely full of shit? I was just, I mean, I'm not, I'm not endorsing any political candidate. I'm a publisher, right? I'm just saying, okay, I just think we should be more careful distinguishing between content and journalism and between, you know, crap and journalism. So that, that was my one question there. And I, I just disagree with you on Facebook and Google. I think I, we, so Google why. Analytics is free. I don't think just because something is free that makes it great. I don't think just because something is popular that makes it great. I mean, Facebook, and there's a whole lot of reasons. I mean, we could talk about Facebook and Google's reputation as it relates to minorities. I mean, they don't employ any minorities. They don't employ any women. You know, these are people who cross out Black Lives Matter and on their, what they call that mall space. So this, between your private space and your house, where you, and the public space we have called mall space. So Facebook has mall space in their offices. So like the public space in the hallway. These are people who are known for crossing out Black Lives Matter in the mall space, meaning the space in your mall, not private space, publicish mall space in their company. So that's one reason you shouldn't be, you know, supporting them. They don't employ any. I mean, they're not supporting ethnic and minorities or women in the, in the country. There's that. I mean, there's also like, why would you want to give them total control? Why why would you want to participate in their monopolization? And the word is monopoly of the industry. Why? 
I, I, don't under, I haven't heard a good reason for what you're suggesting. Well, my reason is that we serve the public. And if the public doesn't want to come to us, and the public's on Facebook, I argue that we should go to them and serve them there. And if Facebook isn't follow, if, it, if face, you ask me a question, I'm trying to answer you. If Facebook is not uh, responsive in some way, they're actually very, very smart people. Let's have a discussion with them. They are open to those discussions. They are doing events. No, fine, they're stupid, they're idiots. And they're worth billions of dollars. And they announced incredible results yesterday. Uh, and they're idiots, fine, fine. Stipulated, they're idiots, stipulated, yes. Hi, um, so I have a question going back to what you mentioned earlier on the high value membership model, which is something that I have been thinking about and giving it a try. But what I am kind of, um, I guess, stuck with is how to balance, for example, if we do move to such a, a membership model, how to balance the independent stance of the, the media um, and being controlled in a way by the, the oh, members. The, the members control you. Yeah. Right, right, right. So if the members are the ones giving you money, how do they control you? Same problem we have with advertisers, right? If the advertisers are giving you money, if government's giving you money, same exact issue we have to be aware of. Absolutely. I'm too close to the mic, so I'm going to move over here. Um, so I, I, I agree. I think there's a lot of things about that. At the end of the day, simply put, your journalists and your asset is your independence and is your credibility and your authority, and you have to keep that paramount. Um, so, so someone trying to come in and give you a bunch of money and control you, you can't do that, right? Um, so I think you probably even have kind of a cap on membership dollars so that no one can come in and give you too much money and say, well, I, I own you now, right? That's an issue with foundations too, right? With grants. Uh, in, in our entrepreneurial program, I insist on running it as, as for profit because I want to learn that discipline. And there was a wonderful, I won't say who she is right now, but there was a wonderful, 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 great person who came in one day to talk about her not-profit business, and I was kind of growling, not-for-profit. And she said right off the bat, she said, you know, not-for-profit sucks because the grant, the foundations want to control what you do, uh, and I want to get more advertising so I can have more independence. So it is important to keep this in mind. The other argument that I can hear about this that we see, I think, in media now is, well, if we give the people what they want, all we're going to do is give them cats and Kardashians. Look at what happens. Look what they go to. But that's a bogus argument because for a few reasons. One is I read lots of serious journalism, but I like cats too. So it's part of my day. Just because I see a cat doesn't mean I don't do anything else and that I'm a complete idiot. Um, what? No, no Kardashians. There's my line. No Kardashians. Uh, uh, so it's not an accurate picture of people as an individual who see lots of things. And the truth is, if that's what we give people, that's what, that's what they go to. It's like when, when I was a kid, you might think it was fun to watch Gilligan's Island, but if it was the only TV you had, it was hell. It was hell, right? More choice is better. Um, so yes, we want to be con concerned about the kind of control. We wanna, you want to hold that independence. I had this conversation with a really good editor I know who said, the third, the third problem is, if I give you 100% of what you want and give you something different, then you're never going to hear something new. That's a problem. But the truth is, we're so far on the other end of that right now, I'm not too worried. Right now, we give 100% of the people who read us all 100% the same thing. If digital allows us to just take out 20% of the noise and give you 20% more relevance for what you care about, because you're a member of the Moms Club, then I've increased my relevance to you, my value to you, by 20%. That's huge. But there's still 80% that I, as an editor, am serving to everyone, and that matters. Make sense? So I think you still want to hold the core of what your value is, your number two back here is number one, and, uh, and hold to that. And yes, be aware of these things. Um, the other issue about membership is I also don't want to find ourselves in closed clubs where the only people who can get information are those who can afford it. That would be wrong. Uh, so I, I don't really mean membership as a paid closed club, but I do mean it as a way to think about higher relevance and value and engagement and that people do have some more control. We should give the public some more control about what we do. One more point, sorry, one more point. Have you heard of Harkin? You want to hear of, heard of Harkin? You guys have, you're cheating. Uh, you're cheating too, Michelle. Um, so let me tell you the story real quick and then I'll, I promise I'll come to you next. A wonderful woman named Jennifer Brendel uh, did an experiment with uh, WBEZ Chicago. Where, I'm sorry, I'm right under the speaker again, so I'm gonna go back over here. 
where she um, started a, a project called Curious City. And she said to um, the audience, you have curiosities about the city. What happens to my recycling? Why is that park never fixed? Whatever. So she said, send in your, your, curio your questions and then vote on them. And the top question, Joe here will go out and report on it. Now what happens is that becomes market research. It, number one, it involves the community in the job of journalism. Number two, it's market research because there are 20 ideas and the most popular one rose to the top, the one people most cared about. Number three, there's marketing value because it's your idea and you said, hey, everybody vote for my idea. Then the neat part is when Joe goes out and does the story, he takes you along so that you can ask your questions of the recycling commissioner and what happens. Right? Pretty cool. I wouldn't suggest you hand over your entire newsroom to this, but what if you took 10% of your journalistic day and said, Tell us what to do. What do you want us to do? That's handing over control in a way that I think is very beneficial that still doesn't lose our journalistic authority and our journalistic control of what's going on. Makes sense, right. So yes, control matters, but so does handing over control matter. Thank you so much for doing all this conference. I'm amazed and I want to share my story uh, as a case study and maybe you can help me because I'm just thinking about this lately. I have this insurance company who wants to place an ad. Actually, I asked them if they want to place an ad because they did it in the past. And they say, well, now we actually want to publish an article. And my, uh, we want to publish our article that will send you and you publish it. And I say, well, if you want to, f to buy a full page, this is our media kit, you can look at that. Um, this is where the conversation is, uh, but, okay. Right. So native advertising. So the whole, uh, Michelle McLennan on that same row has just done a big study on native advertising. You should talk to Michelle. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're very proud and honored to be the host of Michelle McLennan's Michelle's List here at CUNY. And she's also done the study. I'm sorry, I'm gonna get away from the speaker again. Um, so this is the problem of native advertising. And the problem of native advertising is, uh, when I started a magazine at Time Inc, native advertising, when I started a magazine at Time Inc many years ago, a big book of rules plopped on my desk from the American Society of Magazine Editors about how to do ads. And a wise old editor, and we had lots of them at Time Inc, came into my office and said, Jarvis, it's all very simple. It all comes down to this. The reader must never be confused about the source of content. Period. And the problem with native advertising is that we're trying to confuse the readers. And the advertisers want us to help fool them, yeah. right? And we can't do that because if we do that, we have the saying that we eat our seed corn. Our only value is our authority and credibility and independence. And if readers can't tell the difference between an article and an ad, then they're gonna see us as an ad. And we're not worth anything to them then. But at the same time, over the entire industry out there, native advertising is the hot thing, the latest thing that's gonna save us. Paywalls didn't save us, tablets didn't save us, now native advertising is gonna save us. Well, it could kill us. But I also understand, and Michelle, I'm gonna go to Michelle in a second here, I also understand how the advertiser says, well, wait a minute, if you say that you're, I'll give you a different example, Buzzfeed, the home of cats and Kardashians. They made cats famous. So BuzzFeed has a skill, right? BuzzFeed doesn't sell space and time like other media outlets. BuzzFeed sells this skill. I can make my stuff viral, so I know how to make your stuff viral. At BuzzFeed, they have five billion interactions with people every month. Only one billion of those occur at buzzfeed.com. The other four billion occur at 45 different platforms out there, including Facebook, Snapchat, YouTube, et cetera. So BuzzFeed learned this skill, and they say to the advertiser, I can do that for you. Vice, Vice says to an advertiser, we can make our shit cool, I can make you shit cool too. That's what they do. What are we doing now in media? We say, we are storytellers. We know how to tell the stories of the community, so we'll tell your story too. We'll put them together and we'll confuse the audience about which is which. That's giving up our core value. However, they're not wrong to this extent. If storytelling works, for the audience, could it work for them too? I'm not against that as a mechanism for advertising as long as it is clear and labeled. So I think for your insurance company, um, you could give them 
a space in which they can tell their story. Indeed, I wouldn't have a journalist do this, but you could have a salesperson help them do it. Right? BuzzFeed is basically an ad agency. It helps them. But you have to be clear to the reader that it's not an article. It has their story, but it's an ad. It's paid for. Well, that's, I would say that the key word is the A word, is advertising, right? So, right, they're, they're, I'll give you an example, though. I did a little test on this where there's, I went to Upworthy, and they had a box that said promoted, had a little banner that said promoted, and that's, that's, a lot of people use that word, right? So, okay, I wonder, does the audience really know what promoted means? So, I spent 50 bucks of my own money, and I asked 500 people on Google surveys, what does promoted mean? And I gave them four choices. Number one, this was promoted by editors. Number two was promoted by the audience. Number three, by an algorithm. Number four, by an advertiser. The results, 43% got it right, the advertiser. The majority got it wrong. So the majority didn't know it was an ad. So you can't just presume that the word you use, I think advertisement is a clear word, but you can't just presume that you go out and talk to your readers, show them the paper and say, do you know what that is? Can you tell me what that is? And see whether they know. And if they know that came from an advertiser, I'm cool with it. But if they don't, you're harming yourself. So I think you can give that skill. We'll go right back to you. Or go ahead. You're on this. Yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, every week, a circulation manager has to make a marked-up copy with showing advertising and non-advertising that the post office has to get for us to keep our permit. Yes. So that helps keep publish print publishers honest. A bit honest yeah. Right. Yep. So, but we print the word ad advertising on top of advertorial. We, I still call it advertorial. Yeah. The new word is native, native advertising. advertising. But Let me just go to Michelle for one second, because. Oh, Mich Michelle, I gotta go run around. It's okay. okay. I need, I need, uh, John here. I need, I need more steps on my thing. Okay, please. <laughs> Give some advice. Yeah, I'd just throw in a couple things. Um, first of all, on the native advertising or sponsored content, which is what a lot of it is. The, the I went into the study very skeptical. My background is newspapers, um, but a lot of it is not promotional. So when you think about native advertising, a lot of times the content isn't that kind of in your face promotion that we talk about with, with advertising. Uh, some of it is, you know, so-called thought leadership. So the CEO of a tech company writes a column for Forbes on, uh, you know, that, that, you know, allows her to, to show her expertise and, and puts the brand out there. On the, other, on the other hand, the labeling is a real issue. Um, you know, Jeff is absolutely right, and the FTC in December weighed in with some significant concerns about that. So I, I think that the labeling needs to move to paid or advertising. I think paid is, is direct enough. I looked at 14 sites and only two said paid. The rest say sponsored or brought to you by, which is nothing. <laughs> so. yeah. Who was, who was, so what was, oh, right. I essentially wanted to say the same thing like Michelle did, that um, Federal Trade Commission, they issued rules and sort of guidelines how we should be labeling sponsored content. And it's really good and really understandable. And yeah, they totally like knocked down, promoted and stuff, so. Yeah, have you all dealt with the FTC's rules about blogs? So the Federal Trade Commission in the US, which is responsible for consumer protection, uh, issued rules that are more stringent on blogs than they are on publications. So if you accept something free and then write about it, you are now legally required to say that you accepted it for free, even if it's in a tweet. Which I... Explain that. So if, you, if, 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 if I give you this to try it out, right, or you go on a tour somewhere and it's free, or you do whatever, uh, and you end up writing about it, and you don't disclose junkets. that you were junkets or freebies, right? If you don't disclose that you have a financial relationship, you are violating now FTC regulation. Now, they don't do the same thing for big old newspapers or TV stations. There's product placement. You know, you watch, you watch um, American Idol, and they're not all drinking Coke in those Coke glasses, right? That's paid for there, and that's not revealed. So the, the requirements of the FTC on blogs are more stringent than they are on the rest of media. I'm not saying that's necessarily bad, for the blogs, but it's bad of the FTC for the rest of the media. So bloggers must disclose, but newspapers not, not in the same way. I know, I know. It's, it's, 
But basically, an independent person who's writing is under FTC regulation now. Just look at it that way. Who else? Other topics? Yeah. Does that mean that if you if you're you have a comp to an event like a fundraiser or something and you write about it, that's that doesn't fall into the same? No, it, it doesn't. And I don't know what the FTC regulations are exactly. You can go look them up. Uh, you know, I, when I was a young journalist in San Francisco, I remember that there was a play in town that everybody covered because it lasted forever, and I insisted on paying the ticket, and they wouldn't let me, and I wouldn't go in. I was a little bit maybe overzealous, uh, but I do believe we have to be very careful about this, yes. So I think it's always good to try to let it be known one way or the other. Other, yes. Different topics, anything you want. The way people are depending on the digital media, what is the future of the print media, you think? I think the print media question is going to be very, very different in every market, right? So that if you look at the US, I've already gone through what's happening to the dynamics of their business. It's falling apart. We all know that in India and China, it's growing. But I've talked to publishers in India, at least, and they know that the internet, especially mobile, is coming on them very, very fast. And even though print is still growing, and even though print is still profitable, they have to have a profitable digital mobile enterprise going forward. So I was just talking to somewhere here earlier today who said, well, my old readers still want the paper. And if you can make money doing that, keep doing it. I mean, you know, keep doing it. But still remember that a lot of the young readers are not necessarily going to. And so I just, my, my only advice here is, if you don't have a digital strategy, the clock is ticking for you. It may tick a lot longer for you than it ticks for um, you know, the, the Columbus Dispatch, but it's ticking. And so I think you have to have that. The other thing I hear, so I, I dealt with one newspaper in the country some years ago that planned, that looked at the question of, of killing the paper. And they were scared to death of doing this, scared to death. They thought that every old person in town would come marching at the paper with pickets they thought they'd have to give tablets away to every old person because they insisted on reading on something other than this damned laptop. And they thought the advertisers would really revolt. Oh my God. Well, they did a lot of research. They spent a lot of money on research. You know what they found? When people, they were asked, well, we might, we might get rid of the print paper. Eh. We think it is so much more beloved and necessary to people than it may be. Now, I don't know in your markets, it may well be, it probably is. In a lot of cases, it is. I can't afford a phone, I can't afford the data, I don't like this, I still love the paper. I think in many of your markets, that's still the case. But I wouldn't just assume it. I would go talk to people and ask. Now I'll get an argument. Yeah, I have a follow-up question from him. Um, I know that you have information about what I'm going to ask you, so that's why. Do you think, uh, in one percentage, the internet is affecting the decline of El Diario. Do you think the internet is, 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 is taking the, di the Diario down? So I'm both a New Yorker and a professor, so I get to turn a question into a question. What do you think? Zero. Zero. Say more. Yeah, but you, you, you are the guy talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I work there. I work for OI, too. I have a lot of information about what's going on inside of that paper. And uh, yeah. It's, 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 it's basically zero, yeah. Well, but here's, here's the thing, here's the problem I think we have. It's like proving a negative. You don't know who's not coming to you in the first place, has never discovered you because they're somewhere else, because they get their football scores from Univision. And you don't even know that. You never, you never had an interaction with them, so you didn't know you lost them. That's the question we don't know. Argue with me. <laughs> The new owners bought the paper, and even John Payton even said so, said so a long time ago, 95% of our revenue comes for print. But now we are allocating all our resources to digital. Uh, that's called, I don't want to say it. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't want to kill the print cash cow, okay? I don't want to do that. Years ago, I worked for TV Guide magazine. I was a TV critic. Fun job. Why did I leave that? Actually, a wonderfully ridiculous, useless job. It was wonderful. We sent out a survey every year to readers. And every year we got tremendous return because there was unbelievable loyalty. 
If you ever watch that Seinfeld episode of George of, of, of uh, George's father, he would mark it every. Uh, he saved every issue. There was a loyalty to this magazine. One year we got far lower response to our survey, so we did a follow-up survey to say why did so few people respond? Because among those who didn't respond, 80 percent died. <laughs> right. So um, that's a problem. Right? So if you say that, I'm holding on to this group of people because I have to do this. I think there's people we just don't know. So I'm agreeing with you that you don't want to be foolish about turning off a spigot of cash that's coming from print. Absolutely. All I'm saying is we've got to multitask and we've got to learn how to do the new as well. And you don't know who's never come to you because you're primarily print. That's my argument. Yeah, I'll, I'll follow up a uh, uh, commentary. Um, I came, I came, yeah, no, what you, are, what you are talking is very, very interesting. I, 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 love, I want to be your friend and talk about this around, around a glass of wine, probably for hours and hours. But I came here, I don't know, four or five years ago, and this school was talking about one subject, it's Patch. Oh, Patch, American Online, and I know a lot of reporters who left their jobs to go to Patch because that's the future, it's American Online. I look what happened. So Tim Armstrong, I forgot you, Joe, didn't I? I'll come back to you. Now. Tim Armstrong uh, called me up about Patch and said, OK, Mr. Hyperlocal, you come and talk to me about Patch. So I went in and talked to them. And they wanted me to be an advisor, and I said, no. Why? Because they, number one, they didn't play well with others. They went into markets like, like uh, Montclair, New Jersey, and they said, we're going to kill Baristanet because we're just, we're big Patch. We're going to kill them. Right? Well, look where Baristanet is now. Look where Patch is now. The second thing that they did was that they, before they got their business model figured out, they decided to spread times 900 around the country. So they multiplied their mistakes times 900. Then it was too late to fix it. They had too much Silicon Valley ego for their own good, and they didn't do well. But I'm not going to gloat about Patch essentially dying. It's, you know, it's walking dead. Um, uh, well, it's got all the mottled skin and everything else, like waddle, model, Walking Dead. I'm not going to gloat because I think it hurt the cause of, of local. They screwed it up. They did stupid things. They wasted too much money in it. So now I hear people all the time saying, oh, yeah, yeah, patch. So I try to defend the idea of local and community to people, and they say, patch. So I think patch hurt us all by being stupid. And, and I still think there's power in local. Now, I'll now confess mine. I thought... The, I, one thing we saw in the research we've done, the way I put it is, a beat can be a business. Right? A town, an interest, right? you can turn that into a business. We know that. That man back there supports those businesses with the ads uh, at Broad Street and, and sees a lot of these businesses where you basically said, I'm going to turn this into a business. So I said, great. And we know, we, from, from research six years ago, we saw that some of them were making $250,000 a year in cash. Hard work, but they were sustainable. So I said, great, this is the future. The hyperlocal, this is it. It's the building block. So last year here at CUNY, we held training in how to turn a beat into a business. And I thought, and I do a lot of work in New Jersey with the ecosystem there, and I thought, well, I'll fill it up with people in New Jersey who now, journalists, who now out of their jobs, who want to have their own businesses. I couldn't fill it. It was free. I couldn't fill the class. I couldn't fill it. So the problem I have in New Jersey, where I do a lot of work, in addition to New York, is that I think we need to expand the ecosystem. We need more players. But as you all know, that's hard work. And it's kind of not happening. And, and I'm not sure exactly what to do about that. So Patch, I think, really, pardon me for this, fucked it up royally. Um, and they hurt it for all the rest of us. And I have the ego to think that I know what they did wrong, but I don't necessarily yet know how to do it right. So I need to confess that to you. Oh, who else? Go ahead. No, you go ahead. No. Uh, just one more comment about the patch thing, uh, and unfortunately, this um, supports Jeff's whole argument. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately um, is uh, that model is a, is a franchise model, right? Where they picked up a single model and they spread it to 900 communities, and there are other organizations doing similar things. And I think that is the problem. It's not a single franchise model that it's not a McDonald's that you can put in every town in in New, in New, New Jersey, let's say, and it'll work every place. It, there's a different community, there's different people, there's different dynamics, and the franchise model doesn't work. So next time someone tells you that, uh, that like, oh, look, look at, uh, 
look at passion, like what it did to, to local, say that 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 is a not community centric approach, which is very different from what I think media is doing. I think that's true, but you, the franchise model doesn't disappear because it doesn't work as, a, as a, a monolithic thing. There are franchise ideas that work. The idea of providing an infrastructure of back service, like back office services and supporting the independence of journalism journalists to do what they do best, I think is a model that could work uh, and scale and all that, all the other buzzwords. But I mean, the idea of supporting journalists to do what they do best and not making every journalist into a business person. Yeah, I've, I, one thing I dream I've had that we've not, we've failed at too, is to have shared services for a group like you. Advertising backshop, technology backshop, marketing it would be a great, great thing, but we've not kind of, it's, you're all busy. It's hard to do that. So part of what I think you need to talk to CCEM about, uh, and I know you do all the time, but, but where do you want to share your resources so that you can come together and maybe that's the way we, we, we encourage more local. Is there someone else? Ah, sorry. So I'm curious to know from your perspective, and I know you just said you didn't have this figured out from the, the patch equation, but the, the pathway around media and making the switch to digital is littered with fails and mistakes and errors. And so there are a lot of folks in this room who haven't lost their print audiences. They're still really strong and they have an opportunity to learn from those fails and potentially make not the same mistakes. So for those folks, what would you recommend? What are the things that you would say avoid? What are the things that you would say, hey, travel down this path. I think this might be more successful. Great question. And of course, you know, when everybody says great question, they're just buying time to think of an answer. <laughs> um, let me go back up front. Um, so yeah, I think that you make me see that I have a different answer now than I did. I think my answer used to be, you have to change everything. But, but I now know that even though that may still be true, it's impossible to do while you still run the business. So here's what I tell, so I went to a certain big newspaper in the South, I mentioned earlier, the guy with the houses on fire. And I said, okay, you're not gonna, don't do another big newsroom reorganization, don't change the whole business overnight, instead, take two small teams and send them out to communities that are defined by themselves and find out what those communities' needs are and then come back and let's talk. And let's figure out how we can create something, building as little as possible to learn with the, the greatest speed and the least risk possible a new skill of how we can start to serve those communities well in new ways with the new tools that we have. And we're gonna fail we know we're going to fail at some of those. That's okay. But we're gonna succeed at some and we're gonna to start to learn a skill set that we can then say, okay, we now know how to handle a school district site and we're now gonna multiply that over the entire metropolitan area. Or I'm also trying to convince this newspaper to work in a network with their local bloggers who already exist and with their ethnic media that already exist and figure out how you can have shared interests and go listen to them. And bit by bit, piece by piece, we can start to build, find the keys to success and build something new as we transfer the old business over. And if we're really lucky, we'll find something that works for both. So if I do something again for young moms, just my obvious example, that data that I know you're a young mom is useful to me in both businesses, in the old business too, because I can get more advertising value. I can do a special section. I can do all kinds of, of, of old things. Um, so I think that my answer now is try to see where the future is and try to start learning the lessons to build those models bit by bit, example by example. And don't think that you can reorganize the entire thing and change it all overnight because we know we can't. No matter what your business size is, you still have to run your business. You're still making money on print. Don't turn that press off until the day that you feel it's optional and not worth it anymore. That's all I'm saying. Is it lunchtime? Lunchtime. Thank you all for your kind attention.